this is why we're here today. This is information from the State Department of Finance. State Department of Finance has always underprojected growth. Yet they're projecting that our valley, Santa Clara County, is going to have 65 million people in it in the 1950s, before 1960. We have 30, no, this, pardon me, the state of California is going to have that. But let me, the reason, let me tell you the reason why I erred and said Santa Clara County. We're going to take more than the state share because we have the jobs. So there's going to be more people coming to Santa Clara County, to the Bay Area, and to LA than the rest of the state. That's a, nearly a doubling of population. Can you imagine double the population in our valley and still wanting to live here? Well, I can. I can imagine it if we have transit villages because we're, we'll look like Paris. We'll look like Rome. We'll look like the great communities in the world where everything is low rise except over the top of the transit facilities which become high rise. That's the trick. Stack the people up in nice livable communities on top of transit so that we can, we can have a wonderful quality of life. That's why we're here. Here's another reason. This was in the New York Times. Front page, upper right uh, uh, location above the fold, meaning the Times thought it was important. It was on May the 11th, if you want to go back into the records and make copies, and it showed the measurements taken from the ice corings and the corings in the ocean floor sediments for 800,000 years. 800,000 years. And it's also showing the latest measurements of CO2 in our atmosphere taken from four different national, four different nations, no collusion here, in four remote locations in the world. And you see that our current CO2 load, where the red arrow is, the trend is going straight up. It's not bending, it's not sloping, it's going straight up. It also follows 800,000 years of ups and downs and ups and downs, but the peak of those ups and downs is less than half of where we are right now. We're more than twice the global warming characteristics of any time in the last 800,000 years, and we're more than four times the average of the last 800,000 years, with the trend going straight up. If that doesn't scare you, you're not a grandparent. I'm worried about my grandbabies. This was in the August 8th Mercury News. It was syndicated uh, world, uh, uh, nationally. Paul Rogers, by the way, is doing a wonderful job. If you, if you see Paul, give him a hug and remind him that he's one of the warriors that's really doing a job for us. And it says that global warming is occurring, no question, verified by a bunch of Nobel laureates, that the primary source, source of global warming is transportation. 38% of global warming gases are coming from transportation. Now, Greenspan told us years ago that transportation was the easiest pollution to control. And we've, we started doing that in California until we overwhelmed the, uh, that process. So transportation is our focus. Let the others, let, let the Air Pollution Control Board and others take care of the other issues. Transportation, which is land use, are our concern. Now, the next logic step is what kind of transportation? This is the amount of CO2 per passenger mile, per seat mile. You look on the right side and you see automobiles. 
the next is air, and that's all air. If they showed only short hop airlines, that line would be as high as the automobiles. So we need something to replace short hop airlines, like high speed rail. That won't be the subject today. Buses are not super. We're going to get to electrically powered buses soon. But right now, buses are not outstanding, but they're a whole lot better than air and cars. And then you get to the electrically powered transportation systems. Commuter rail, metro rail, like BART. Light rail, like our, our light rail system in Santa Clara County, VTA, and high speed rail. Those are electrically powered transportation systems. They've got big parking lots. They've got airspace over their stations. And that's where those transit villages need to go so that people then naturally use the most non-polluting form of transportation. Those last three slides are your foundation for today's presentation. Now, this is a picture, and I won't give it anymore because Peter's going to tell you about it, of Peter's depiction of transit villages. You notice they're not next to each other. They're all built on top of a podium on top of transit and parking around transit, but they're not smack next to each other. Everybody's got sight lines. You've got grassy areas near the locations, so they're nice to live around. And they'll handle tens of thousands of people on top of each one if we do it right. Now, that's where each one of those little circles is a station already in Santa Clara County. We can expand that up to San Mateo County, Alameda County, and you realize already in our county, we've got 60 some odd stations. Over half of those are ready for transit villages. They've got parking lots you can build over. They've got adjacent land you can build over. You can build right over the top of the stations. So we've, under, we've seen what we were concerned about, why we were concerned about it, how dramatic it is, what, it, what we can do to fix it, and where we can, where we can build to, to fix it. Now we're going to hear what's being planned from the experts. That's a picture of one of those stations. And you can see all kinds of open space around that station on top of parking. OK, now this, I'm going to skip this. This is an animation. Well, it's only two minutes, so we'll look at it. This is um, that downtown station in San Jose, whatever it's called. <laughs> and, and what you see first is what we have now. You've got three different commuter rail systems in, Amtrak. You've got light rail coming out from under the station, from a tunnel. And then you see what's planned. You have a high-speed rail station. I don't know whether it's going to be exactly like this, but it will very likely be elevated. And maybe there'll be, other than a canopy, ideally, there'd be several stories of development on top of that. And then you see the developments adjacent on top of the BART station and adjacent to the other transit. Now, the only thing you lack there to have it perfect is to have that atop a podium so that all of the dirty stuff, the automobiles and, and buses and so on, would be a level below where you live. And then your high rise would be on top of that. That's the contact information for the Manetti Institute. We're happy to be of service to you. Um, in the long-term uh, perspective of the future that Rod has sketched, um, not that long, but say to 2050, a sprawl as a land settlement pattern and the mass use of the private personal car is, is simply exhausted. The, the car in particular is a is a wonderful technology, but it doesn't scale to carry 
100% of the people to 100% of the destinations, 100% of the time. It just just won't do it. And what, what you get is congestion um, and, and huge expense, as we all know. And I, I want to stress that when we talk about expense in this field, we're not just talking about money. We're talking about expense in energy. Um, and particularly expense in personal time, the, the amount of time that we all spend in cars, the amount of time that we all spend, good, great, sorry. Uh, the amount of time that we all spend in cars now um, is, for, for how many of us is it good time? For how many of it is, is it time that we really are doing what we want to do or, or, or even getting where we want to go? Um, so this system has become uh, exhausted, I, I propose to you. Um, its costs have simply become unsupportable. We are further pushed into change by the slow but grave damage to climate from the use of fossil fuels, which in the Bay Area is mainly from transportation. And Rod has just sketched that now. This is a massive, unaddressed problem by the United States as a whole, not to speak of the world. But uh, the fact that it's not addressed and we're not doing what we should be doing doesn't mean that it's not that serious a problem. It's, it is the problem of our period. Um, and it is pushing us, in this case, to move away from a recipe of sprawl and private cars. But we also have a major regional, regional asset, not fully used, an extensive electric rail system which doesn't take fossil fuels. And I'm, I'm thinking here for Silicon Valley on the assumption that Caltrain becomes electrified. The challenge becomes to put as many as possible of the Bay Area's next million people onto our rail system and off the auto highway system. But can that be done without deterioration of our standard of living? Because if it, if it puts a major gash in our standard of living, it simply will not happen. I think it can be done. Uh, in fact, we are well into the transition, the great turning of an ocean liner under SB 375, the region-wide planned Bay Area was finished last summer. It clusters people in priority development areas, which they call PDAs, in principle holding out financial incentives for density and for reducing vehicle miles traveled. Plan Bay Area is a big, region-wide, is a big and very positive marker of a, of a turn away from a, a difficult and unsatisfactory history. Let's see, let's see if we get this to go. Yeah. The PDAs, the, pri the uh, priority development areas, and I expect the urban villages in San Jose's new plan, open space to move people toward transit. But it will be a lot better. I mean, uh, it will be a big difference better for our health and for our household energy, our personal time, and financial costs if we can systematically cluster people not just generally closer to rail transit than they were before, but close enough so that they can easily and conveniently walk to the station. This cuts out uh, an intervening car trip to the transit, and the station is no longer surrounded by giant parking lots. Red residents will walk not just to the station, but to many of the places that members of a family or a household go to every day, and with a minimum of street crossing, that further dispenses with automobiles and auto trips, which we normally give to all those small errands of life. Can such density be made humane, comfortable, affordable, and attractive to the broad run of Californians? They are members of the automobile suburban culture, which has now been running for 50 plus years, and it's the majoritarian national culture. Nonetheless, I think transit-oriented development can be made desirable to this essentially the central broad population, not just uh, early adopters. That's the design challenge. There will be lots of responses, but we need one response to get started, and this approach can be called a center. Ten thousand people, uh, a, a radius of two thousand feet, which gives two hundred eighty-eight acres. High frequency regional rail station at the center, reached by walking paths, not roadways. These these paths, these, these are pedestrian, pedestrian paths. Oh, 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 oh. These are pedestrian paths, not, not roadways. 
uh, and it, <laughs> I'm going to get the hang, get the hang of this. Um, there are some townhouses, but mainly mid-rise and high-rise multiple unit buildings along the paths, generally getting taller and more concentrated towards the center around the transit station, which in this case is underground. Uh, particularly toward the middle, there will certainly be mixed use, uh, including commercial and clean industrial work sites. I want to stress that, particularly for San Jose. I realize that uh, I'm learning in the process of visiting you to speak that the great problem in San Jose is to bring in industry and commerce and not to intensify its role as a bedroom town for Silicon Valley. And this schema, I must say, in, in my mind, was developed as a response to problems of people and of housing, but it in no way excludes development for uh, for industry and for, for commercial ventures of all sorts. Uh, all the basic services for 10,000 people, notably a supermarket and a drugstore, but also the post office, restaurants and cafes, kids' recreation areas and churches, all of them are walkable and with minimized or no street crossings to get to them. By using high-rise buildings for uh, most but not all residents, we preserve a very large amount of open space for an entire range of users, uses from fine, fine grained ones like community gardens and tennis courts towards the center of the fingers of the hand, in, in where, where, we, where, we, where we narrow down, uh, out to soccer fields, uh, baseball fields, even a small lake or a grove of trees where the green becomes more, more extensive. What also contributes to, to ha having all this open space and, and producing this open space as, as part of a, a reasonable human life is, is a main object of the design. What also contributes to it is the banishing of cars. Uh, when you think of how much space cars take up between roads and parking in, in any American city, or any American situation practically, you realize that it's a great deal of space. And in this case, we put the cars underground and taken back the space for, for, for green space, for open space. This creates a better and especially a safer outdoor environment. And I want to stress this particularly for children, because I must say, this hearing the people wrestling with design problems in one of the sessions this morning. Nobody seen, the planners don't seem to be terribly concerned about family situations and about children. Uh, and here, this is expressly designed to be an urban situation. Um, it's post-suburban in a way. It's certainly moving in the direction of urbanization as world history is right this minute. Um, but it very much, the, the, the central clients of it, the central people that it's aimed at, are the general population to begin with, but also families and children. Good, okay, good. Um, we are aiming to attract eventually not just early adopters, but the central mass number of the population to this low greenhouse, time-saving way of life. Therefore, we don't design, it's not conceived for demographic slices or niches of our population, such as the well-off, who basically are the objects of almost all market design that goes on now, nor specifically low-income people as such. It is not intended to be low-income housing, because if it were, that would rule out serving the great mass of the population. And in this, in this case, eventually, we're looking for large central numbers of the population, uh, nor is it designed to be exclusively for seniors. Obviously, this sort of proximity, this sort of concentration, general relaxation of the need to drive is favorable to seniors, but on the other hand, it's not favorable to seniors to live in a, in a niche of their own. And, and, and for seniors to put themselves into sort of a gerontocratic prison. This is, is intended to keep the whole population together. The, I must say, at the, at the heart of this problem, there is a need for a new building. This is a call to the architects. Um, most people will be living in multi-unit housing. 
But as the center aims to give residents a, 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 an actively desirable place to live, that means generous square footage and ceiling heights, as well as abundant light from more than one side and true acoustic privacy. Good natural light and, and is provided by the slender tower form, uh, which in a certain sense is borrowed from Vancouver, British Columbia. I penciled it in here as a, a, a building dimension of 80 feet by 80 feet, which gives a full floor plate of about 6,400 square feet. And in principle, that would be between four and six apartments and have 10 or 12 people on a floor. But this sort of high-rise building is more expensive than the small houses of sprawl. Um, and so innovations, st structural, not just marginal innovations, but structural innovation, central strategic innovations in high-rise construction are needed. That includes on-site or off-site prefabrication, and especially new materials such as composite timber, high-tech concretes and glass. Cost gains are also available from economies of scale when the project is large, and from leaving as much as possible of the interior finishing of apartments to people. Uh, we would certainly design here for energy capture and efficiency, looking for every possible tool to, to bring that about. Most importantly, the design I've shown you here uh, is it aims for people to think of it as permanent, stable homes, multi-generational homes. These are not places that you, apartments that you come into to live for a year or two while you're looking for a house, but they're meant to be, as they are in New York, for example, handed down from generation to generation. And when you put together a lot of people who are stable, over the generations in one place, you get a real community. And that, again, is also an aim of this design. Thank you, Rod. And uh, it's great to be here uh, and to be part of uh, this summit once again, and especially be part of the panel that's um, organized by the Mineta Transportation uh, Institute, and especially Rod Deardon Sr., I think we all can agree, has been the champion uh, for all of us, uh, and even for those that don't know uh, behind the scenes uh, what Rod has done for our entire region is just tremendous. So Rod, thank you for your work and for being our role model. Uh, for all, the role model for all of us. And the question posed in this forum, transit villages or urban sprawl, the, deci the decision is now. Uh, certainly, the decision is now. It's also tomorrow, although we certainly, uh, as Rod pointed out, and uh, Dr. Leiden pointed out, we don't really have many tomorrows left to make those decisions. And the decision, unfortunately, was also yesterday. And we're suffering through the consequences in many ways of decisions that were made by people in the past, uh, particularly uh, decades ago when this, this kind of sprawl mentality in the automobile industry uh, had uh, such a tremendous amount of influence on the way we designed our communities. So we can either be in a state of despair and just say, okay, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, we can't do anything about it. Uh, and eventually just move out and find some other place uh, that's uh, more desirable in the future. Or we can make this, spa this space and this place we call home continue to be an extraordinarily desirable place to live and to be. And that's truly my hope and the hope I know of, of not just the folks here on the panel, but of so many of you that are here, many of whom I know as leaders in the community that carry a lot of influence and put a lot of thought in, into the decisions that you make. I'm going to, in a moment, uh, hand it over to and, and work in tandem with uh, Laurel Prevetti from the city of San Jose. And, and then I'll circle back uh, afterward, after she's done with her presentation, to have some, somewhat of a call to action uh, as, you know, on behalf of all of us. Uh, and certainly on behalf of those that are in the elected office positions right now, you know, in addition to being chair of ETA, uh, I appreciate Rod going over the, the global warming uh, issue because I was just I just finished as a year of chair of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and the reality is that these issues, none of them, none of these issues should be considered alone uh, in their own silos. 
we have to have the commingling of dialogue. We have to have the expertise uh, to make good quality decisions. And ultimately, we need all of you in order to execute because uh, we don't have the individual wherewithal as elected leaders to do it without your support. And so before I add on to that, I would like Laurel to join me up here uh, as we uh, do a, a, a slide presentation. And let me uh, first start by introducing Laurel Prevetti, who is uh, the, the uh, assistant director of the Department of Planning. She's really, the, you know, the, she's the acting director essentially at the moment. Um, you know, I, I at least consider her that. Uh, and and I got to tell you, you know, um, in her years, and, and she's done a tremendous amount of work over the years, including overseeing the. the preparation for our general plan 2040. Uh, I was on the planning commission before I was on city council. I've learned so much from Laurel uh, and, and a lot of my, the development of my philosophies and my thoughts about urban planning, transit oriented planning, my thoughts about how we build better communities comes from Laurel. And I'm very happy that she's here. Oftentimes you will hear from elected officials and they like to take credit for all the great stuff that happened and blame staff for things that don't turn out so well. Uh, I don't think that uh, elected officials take enough time to give credit to where the credit really is due, and that's the staff, uh, whether it's a, a city organization, county, transit agencies, uh, it's the staff that really does the work, and Laurel is a prime example of, of a great leader we have in San Jose, and so, Laurel. Thank you. And then right. Okay. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction. And it's great to see all of you here this afternoon. This is a really important topic, and each of us can make an important contribution to making more transit villages throughout the Bay Area. I'm going to talk about San Jose's example and some elements of success, but I do want you to think about how you can relate these ideas to your own situation, your own community, wherever you may be, a small town, a large city. There's room for all of us to participate to make more transit friendly locations. I also want to talk about how we can do this in terms of building great places. So it's not just about the transit, it's about really making great walkable, livable places. So one of the greatest tools that the cities in California have is our general plan. This is really the blueprint for how all of our communities should grow, not just in terms of land use, but in terms of transportation for all modes of getting around, whether you're a pedestrian, you're a cyclist, you like to take transit, or you do a combination of all three. So we really need to use this tool as our base for creating a strong policy framework, and that creates the opportunity for our elected officials to have the political will that's going to be necessary for those tough project by project decisions that come before them. We believe very strongly in our city that we need to do this in partnership with our community. So when we updated our general plan, we had thousands and thousands of people participate. And what they told us is that it was time for San Jose to plan for people and not just cars. We grew up, our vast time of growth and expansion happened all around the automobile. And we heard from the community members that this was, it was time to stop. Of course, in the background, the planners were cheering as well as our colleagues in the Transportation Department and the Valley Transportation Agency. So our challenge was then, how do we come up with a plan that's going to meet this community desire? So what we did was we said, well, what's all the transit investment coming into our area? Of course, as was identified earlier, we already have great resources in terms of bus, light rail. BART is under construction and coming to San Jose, and we're very hopeful that we can bring it all the way into downtown San Jose. We're working hard on bus rapid transit. We're building bicycle trails and other things. So we really need to use this transportation framework as, our, um, as really the foundation for where and how we grow. And what our city council agreed to when we were adopting our general plan is we needed to focus growth to where those transit locations are. So that includes our downtown, certainly North San Jose, but also these, all of these light rail stations. And so these are some examples examples of not just housing, but also mixed-use development that can happen at these places. So this is a, an I, I 
a diagram essentially of our 180 square mile city. So we're a very big place. And what you see are the colors on the map, which are the, um, the blue areas are our employment areas, which are very key. Our, the brown areas are where we've done specific plans and we've already been focusing growth in those locations. Our downtown is the purple in the center. And then you'll see these spines and corridors where we are planning transit. And those are the places where we intend to focus growth, mixing uses of jobs and housing, schools, parks, recreation, arts, entertainment, all of the things. And then much to the neighborhood's um, comfort, we're not going to be building uh, and squeezing in high density housing in all the yellow areas. So all of the neighborhoods are going to stay intact. And that was really important. So that way they knew that, yes, we're going to see some taller buildings, but where we're going to see them is in the right places at transit. So this is an example of a project that's currently under construction in San Jose. It's Samsung's campus up at First in Tasman. It's over 600,000 square feet. It's a green building. It's got green gardens. It's going to be fabulous. It's right at the light rail station at First in Tasman, and it's welcoming the community into its campus, unlike some of the other tech um, <laughs> developments that are underway. This is another campus that's right at light rail, first in Brokaw. It's still going through the planning process, but we expect it to obtain its permit here very shortly, and then we're hoping to break ground. This is a very large campus of 2 million square feet. And I know others of you in the audience, your cities are doing great in terms of economic development, so this probably sounds like no big deal. But for San Jose, where we have been the bedroom community, this is a big deal for us. And it's at transit. So as we uh, look to how we're going to accommodate all the population growth, we had great success with our community leaders around focusing that growth in new transit villages. So we're calling them urban villages. Uh, we recognize we may need to change the name at, at some point, but we're planning for 120,000 new homes, which is more than most cities are planning um, for their general plan. So we've got a lot of housing that we need to build, but we want to do it right and we want to make it livable walkable and bicycle friendly. We have some plans underway. Hopefully some of you have seen the Duradon plan. We just finished the circulation of the environmental impact report. We're going to be bringing that one to city council hopefully in June of this year. And that really sets the ground floor for building the transit village at the Duradon station. So we're very excited about that. Right next door is our uh, neighborhood business district called the Alameda. Whole Foods is now under construction. We have some housing development and other businesses along that corridor and we're doing our one of our first village plans in that area and that will be set for council adoption later this year as well. VTA owns a lot of surface parking lots at the light rail stations and we are working in partnership with them around their joint development opportunities at these stations. So for us, it's all about a commitment to collaboration. Cities don't build it alone. We plan for it. We help our, the developers get through our processes. But it really needs to be an interdisciplinary um, strategy. That's why all of you can play a role in working with us to make this happen. It's also important that agencies work together, that the city and the VTA and other agencies that we have a common goal. Rather than fighting over the cheese, so to speak, we need to start working together and create those strategic alliances. So we're really happy the leadership group is here, who's been a strategic partner for the decades that I've been working on transit-friendly communities. And from our research, we know now that people are choosing where they want to live first, and then looking for work and their home. So we, it's really imperative that we build quality communities, because that's going to make the difference in terms of where people live. And we know the younger generations prefer to use transit and cycling rather than their automobiles. So thank you, and I'll turn it back over to the council member. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Laurel. And I, I want to spend the final few, uh, few minutes of my time uh, really kind of just wrapping up some of the things Laurel talked about, some of the details of things that San Jose is doing. The reality is that even what San Jose is doing, from my perspective, I think Laurel would agree, is not enough. And part of that has to do with the fact that uh, it's really political inertia. It's, it's the difficulty of making those bold changes overnight. And so we need to, as a community, understand the importance of not just educating ourselves 
and coming to the right place on, on, on policy and as Rob was mentioning, doing the right thing for our grandkids, not just for our, you know, the next year of our lives in our neighborhood. Uh, we, we really have to start getting the message out to the community in an informative manner so that we can get buy-in from a broader, uh, a broader network of community leaders and a broader network of businesses, labor, what have you. And, and the reality is if you talk to, and I'm glad uh, we have Jessica from the leadership group here, you talk to most companies, they're on board. You talk to most you know, unions, they're on board. The, we, we have the, the appropriate number of puzzle pieces, now we have to put the puzzle together which can always be very challenging. And I'll be, I'm very excited to have Nuria Fernandez as our new general manager coming from New York City as COO there. She understands the need to create places uh, around the transit centers and above the transit centers. And so these talks, uh, in, her, in the very short time she's been here, and the, one of the priorities we have for this year is doing a, an asset evaluation of all of our assets, all the land we have, and having our city partners county, other jurisdictions treat the VTA as a landowner, not just as some other government agency that does transit, so that we can actually come to these comprehensive plans and make it work and make it happen. And um, we'll be going on a leadership group trip this next month to try to get more money for BART and bringing BART all the way through to San Jose, as well as some of the other priorities. We're going to be groundbreaking on BRT, on bus rapid transit, which is a perfect example of a, the kind of project where we need to have community buy-in. And we need um, to have people like me that are on VTA board or on in city councils. Um, you know, in San Jose, it's, it's maybe not as challenging because we're a larger city and we have, uh, I think there's an understanding of the need to create these spaces. And I think through the general plan process, we really engage literally hundreds and hundreds of community leaders that then went back to their neighborhoods. And so now we have BRT groundbreaking on Allen Rock. And uh, there, there, isn't as, there isn't the negative fanfare about it. It's really a very positive uh, outcome that we're achieving with getting BRT in San Jose. It may not be the case in other parts of the valley, but those kinds of projects are critical before you even get to the step of creating a village. You need to have the transit nodes that make sense. And politicians need to have, elected leaders need to have backing. They can't, be, they can't feel like they're going it alone as they sit on that dais. And that's why everyone in this room is critical in order to create these villages. Right now, we have a development in my district uh, at Hitachi. Clearly not the urban village uh, that we envision for the future, but it's the village we can do right now. Uh, and based upon all the different pressures that we have, based upon you know, the, the, the economics of the day, based upon how far the council is willing to go, and based upon how far the community is willing to let us go. But we are creating something there that never would have been there when I grew up in the 70s and 80s in South San Jose, when it was the IBM campus. If, if there was a proposal to put something like that there, um, you know, the developers have been up in arms, the planning department said, what are you thinking about? The you know, OED, our office of economic development would have, been, you know, would have been gone crazy. Now, we're at least on the same page and understand the direction we have to go into. And we're building 3,000 homes right next to two light rail stations with the, with the pedestrian overcrossing to a Caltrain station. That's a great step a great step in the right direction. And I'm very excited about it. But I think Rod is absolutely right by saying we need to do even more. We need to build up over our stations. We need to do that in order to create great places while accommodating the people coming into our valley, coming into the Bay Area. And so I call on each of you, and, and I, I see a lot of you are, you know, a lot of you I know, and a lot of you I know in different capacities, some of you are different community leaders, see PAC representatives here. Uh, you're the ones that we're going to rely on to, first of all, do what you're doing today, educating yourself on the issue. And if you agree that we need to choose It'll make the right choice. If you agree that we need to choose transit villages over urban sprawl, then you have to all individually take it upon yourselves to take your leadership role now into the community and to help educate your neighbors, to be at those meetings uh, where oftentimes we, we get folks that just don't want any change in their neighborhood uh, and there's 20 of them and there's no one speaking up on behalf of what we know we have to do. So if we're not going to do urban villages, tell our grandkids, what do you plan on doing? 
If you don't want high-speed rail, tell our grandkids what is your alternative to accommodate the growth that we're going to have and the people that are going to continue to be moving in to be born into this state. Uh, if you don't want, um, if you don't want a, a, a vibrant light rail system, if you don't want BART coming into San Jose, you're entitled, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but you have to come up with an alternative. And there are, at this point, no alternatives that I see to creating these urban villages. It's something we have to do if we want to make this a place where we all want to continue to live. It's also something that we have to do for future generations. Uh, and the reality is, population is going up around the whole world. And so, as the rest of the world is figuring out how to deal with this in their own places, we've got to figure it out here uh, before uh, global warming drowns us all out. But uh, in any case, I, I thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Uh, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. And so Laurel and I are here. Uh, any specific questions about San Jose, but I think more significantly, the broader discussion, what we can do as a community, uh, as a community right here today, what can we do tomorrow to ensure we're making the right decisions? Thank you. Um, so thank you, Rod, first of all, and, and thank you to MTI and to Transform for making today possible. It's a really excellent bringing together of diverse stakeholders with common goals. So thank you for that. Let's try that one. Okay. So Rod just said, uh, you know, what is the leadership group? We were founded in 1978 by David Packard of Hewlett Packard, essentially because Silicon Valley companies were starting to realize that if they didn't participate, choices that were bad for the Valley were going to be made. So we're a public policy think tank. We have roughly 400 members from throughout the region, and we advocate on their behalf on issues around transportation, energy, environment, housing, education, um, and, and more. And so um, there we go. So why I'm here today and, and why our hammer is going to, to come down, as, as Rod so eloquently put it, is because our priorities depend on this being a priority. Uh, essentially, we have uh, outlined in our transportation portfolio the following uh, priorities for uh, this year and the coming couple of years, but it's also our land use priorities, our housing priorities, our environmental priorities, our energy priorities. They're all intertwined here. And specifically, you can see that uh, the importance of TOD, uh, without it, we cannot have real success on any, uh, on most of our priorities uh, within this area. So. Um, BART to Silicon Valley, uh, many, many of you know that uh, we co-led or led the campaigns that have um, had the, the sales taxes for BART operations and capital in 2000 and 2008. We are incredibly invested in that project and really need to see it succeed. And to do that, we need to have the land uses right around it. Transit and rail, we recognize that all of our transit and rail systems are interconnected. We need them all together to succeed. But even beyond that, we need the supporting pricing policies. We need the supporting land use policies uh, to make them truly successful. And traffic relief, we're not going to build more auto capacity significantly in this area, period. And so what are we going to do to create viable alternatives? And finally, active transportation is a, is a hallmark for many of our companies that have 7 to 8% of their employees showing up on a bike every day. Talk about low carbon transportation, pretty good. Um, so we've seen some amazing pictures about what can be, and I hate to bring us down just a little bit, but this is what is. These are, these are some snapshots from right around our office, right near the airport, and you'll see the lovely light rail line right there. And who wants to get there, you know, by foot or, or by bike or, or any other means? It's really challenging, and we see exactly why our transit ridership is 3.2% of our commute trips in Santa Clara County. It's not the fault of the transit system to a large extent. It's the rest of what goes on around here. Uh, this is another, another shot on um, my commute. We have a member company, eBay, right around the corner from us. You know what we're missing? Sidewalks. Sidewalks. There's no sidewalk on this 10-minute walk. Um, and, oh my gosh, I mean, let's start with fundamentals, sidewalks, and then, yeah, let's talk about the rest of, of what makes a community. <laughs> Absolutely. No, really true. And then um, just another example from another part of our system that just 
it's, it's hard to imagine how we could have successful ridership um, with, with some of the design uh, around the system. So really what we're talking about today is getting to implementation, right? And how to do that um, quickly from where we are to where we need to be. We've seen these pictures of Deirdon Station uh, currently and, and the future. And so uh, now for the, the texty slide, but essentially I, I want to uh, borrow a little bit from Spur's newest report on getting to great places. Uh, happy to be on the Spur San Jose City Board and uh, think that a lot of the work that, that Spur is doing really reinforces what we at the leadership group want to see with the design expertise. So, uh, you know, you can read, I don't need to, but the key is if you're a transit rider, if you're a cyclist, if you're a pedestrian, how is it that you navigate this system? And right now it's, it's pretty tr tricky and we don't uh, talk about the integration that we need, either physical or even on the service and operations side. Uh, again, pay attention to walkability. Every transit rider for some portion of his or her trip is a pedestrian and our pedestrian spaces don't measure up. Oops, density. We've talked a lot about density. I think that's a point that, that has been um, made. But density by itself does not change travel behavior. It has to be everything wrapped up together. And I think I'm going to pause on this point just briefly because during uh, Dr. Leiden's talk, I think we all have gotten a little bit of a promotion here by, by Rod at one point or another today, which is, which is wonderful. Um, but but as, um, as Peter put it, um, I was thinking about the most convenient and the most green place I have ever lived. It was healthy, I walked almost everywhere, it was convenient, I had grocery stores and anything else I could have desired within a 10 minute walk. It was lively, it was enjoyable, uh, it was Manhattan. And I lived in 200 square feet, um, you know, it was expensive, but, but it was, you know, the opportunities um, to have a green lifestyle easily, but even beyond that, to have these opportunities for chance interaction, you know, whether it was the time I crossed the street with Marky Mark, which was pretty exciting, or, or the essentially weekly inter, um, times that I ran into somebody from college, you know, who I hadn't seen, just on the street. It's just, you know, it's a paradigm shift for our region to think about these type of living situations, not as things that are being imposed on us or that we have to do, but rather as something that are the thing we want to do and the, and the best thing for us and for our families and our lifestyles. So editorial aside on my living in New York, but um, back to things about uh, you know, how we make this a reality here in terms of we have a lot of transit adjacent development. And I walked out of a member company a couple weeks ago and it was right next to light rail. And it took me 15 minutes to get to the platform from the door that I could leave from. Right across the street. So it needs to be more than just adjacent, it needs to be oriented uh, to transit. And then, you know, another, uh, another key piece of this is, you know, it's density, it's, it's density minimums, it's parking maximums, and it's um, really addressing the building form up front. Um, so in terms of what's the path, I just wanted to think about one example that is, uh, you know, not, not too far afield for us, but this is the, the Trans Bay Tower. And, you know, the, the world of transportation implementation takes a long time. This has been in the work for a decade and a half, 20 years. Thank you. Yes, I was not in the field at that point. Um, but the Trans Bay Tower will be the Bay Area's uh, tallest building and a lot of density right there, right on top of the station, just like we're discussing. But it's not just this development that was part of making the overall system work. The, there we go, the San Francisco, to its credit, took it upon itself to consider not just the building, not just the development, um, and not even just that right around it, but instead this whole region of south, south of market in San Francisco. And they looked at 
all of these factors. They looked at the, the basics, the land use, the zonings, the densities, but they looked at the transportation and the circulation. They looked at what the management of that circulation was going to be and what, you know, how you were incentivized to get to this particular place. They looked very closely at the urban design and the form, the streetscape, again, the walkability as a walking first place. And they looked at the whole system of sustainability. So not only the building types, but also what were the energy systems going to be? What are the water systems going to be? Of course, the transportation system is fundamental to this. But then they also looked at what, what's the capacity and what does that mean for the kind of values and the market and what the incentives are going to be for different developers and the public. So how do we align the incentives so that people build the type of things that create a lot of public value as well? And I don't think we've, we've paid enough attention to those details to get us from today to tomorrow. Um, so Osh incredibly eloquently went through the issue of political will. So I think, you know, you, you have all heard the call to action that without us uh, be vocal about this, it's not going to happen. And we've also heard um, today, earlier and, and now, a different orientation from our public sector um, partners, especially the transit agencies and the cities, about how to use their publicly owned land and how we can really model the best development um, in that way. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to questions. I think we already have one that's been given up here. How does this fit uh, in with the dire need that we've got in this community for uh, extremely low income housing? We have, according to the last housing element, over 20,000 uh, units needed in this community. So will this be incorporated into these villages? Uh, I, I can speak at least from San Jose's perspective. There's no doubt that affordable housing has to be part of the discussion, and not just the discussion, but the implementation. Uh, we're, we're facing a dire situation in terms of not just homelessness, but people that are at risk of losing their homes, people that can't even get into rental, let alone buy a home. Uh, and I think that what these kinds of villages can provide, because you're maximizing the space, and because you're building more densely, it allows you the opportunity to have a whole range of housing styles as well as price ranges, including uh, different potential for inclusionary housing and what have you. And, and what that does is a couple of things. First of all, uh, just whether you have plenty of resources or if you're or you're struggling economically, being close to amenities is a, is a great thing. But it's especially a great thing if you don't have a lot of resources to be close to transit, close to grocery stores, close to your uh, schools, close to uh, uh, social services. And so it provides an opportunity for us right now where we have a county of two million people and the county is spread all over the place providing social services. If those, uh, the affordable housing stock is placed where everybody else is and everything else is, it also makes it easier to deliver those services. So the short answer is absolutely, I, I think your point's well taken. We have to incorporate housing stock and, and housing availability as part of that equation. I would only add that um, some great work has been done by Transform and others about rethinking the question of affordable housing to be a question of affordable housing plus transportation. That these things are not separate and so if we can look at you know the, your overall burden of, of housing and transportation together instead of in two pieces, I think that really would, would help um, have a more honest dialogue about the, the cost burden. You have a question. So this is a, a question from Salita Dada. And uh, you can add to any of this, but I'll go ahead and read it. Um, two big factors that determined where we bought our house, and many other people I know, were price and the quality of the school district. Any thoughts on how the school district can be incorporated into these plans? Laurel. 
jump in. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for our planning, we did engage with our 19 school districts in the, the city of San Jose, mm -hmm. and we reached out not just to the school districts themselves, but to the charter community as well as our private schools. So they are very much part of the plan. It's really important that we have quality schools in all of our neighborhoods because as, as families start making the choice to have children, education and quality education is, is really important and key. And, and now, just to add to that is that um, it, and there's a lot of land that a lot of the schools have, right? And part of the problem that they have is resources to upgrade their facilities. So there's a great opportunity that we're trying to take advantage of as partnering to create, you know, soccer fields, baseball fields that the city may be able to use on the weekends or evenings and now the, the kids at the daytime have the opportunity. So there's definitely um, more of a need because of resources for us to collaborate whether we like to or not. In fact, one of the newest community centers we have, uh, Edenville Community Center in my council district, is a wonderful community center that's used, it's on Oak Grove School District where the, the middle school is on their land. So we partnered with them, they gave the land, we built it, and now in the daytime, uh, the middle school kids use it, after school, Boys and Girls Club, in the evening and weekend city. So those kinds of collaborations are certainly, ha they have to be part of this type of village concept. Yes, the back, sir. Hi, my name is So I'm really excited to be here just to learn about what's going on regionally. But one of the things that I hear, you know, in the previous workshop, what I hear missing is the line to, you know, from the, the, you know, the low income or the living workforce, right? So it's great to hear this, you know, that there's going to be, you know, these developments coming in, a lot of them on campuses. But, you know, what, you know, what I'm curious to, you know, specifically for the San Jose region and the general plan, I'm curious to learn or to hear what are some of the strategies that have taken place to engage that community, right? A lot of folks, don't rely on public transportation, they, you know, because they, you know, they are the living force. They, you know, they go out of San Jose or you know, outside of the cities to work. So I'm curious to hear, you know, what, what's been some of the strategies. Thank you for the question. Social equity and environmental justice was one of the key components of our general plan. And what that means for our community was, first of all, engagement, making sure that we were reaching out to communities that don't typically participate in planning processes so that their voice could be heard. We did an online survey that people could use Google Translator to translate into whatever language they were most comfortable with. And we were able to get thousands of people who typically don't come to evening meetings because they're busy putting food on the table. So we were able to reach some of those individuals. We could certainly do more. Um, there's always more that, that could always be done in terms of engagement, but that's key. Second is around making sure that we have affordable places for families of all incomes to live in our community. And San Jose has probably the strongest track record of all of Silicon Valley cities in terms of being able to create those choices. The other call to action beyond transit villages is really a call to action to the state of California and our federal government around how are we going to help pay and attract more affordable investment because right now without the tool of redevelopment and redevelopment agencies we are just scrambling to figure out how we're going to make up that gap so that way our nonprofit builders can get back into the business of building the quality affordable housing that, that they've been doing in the past so so it's going to be um, a challenge but our goal is to have integrated neighborhoods so that all incomes are living together, all generations are living together, and that's fundamental in the San Jose plan. Hi, I'm Sodal, and I'm a student at San Jose State. Uh, I'm just curious to know what is the role of build on station is going to be for San Jose, and how is San Jose envisioning the growth of the area uh, as per the plan of build on station? So we're very excited about the Deardon plan. Uh, it is planning for thousands of square feet for office, as well as entertainment, and of course, an A's baseball stadium, which we're very excited about. We're also looking at where we can put appropriate uh, housing and mixed-use development. So it's important to note that the Deardon station isn't an island by itself, but it's in a framework of an existing city. It's adjacent to downtown. It's right at the arena where our um, 
San Jose Sharks play, and we have neighborhoods that surround it. So it's really important that we integrate the new development with the existing in a way that is sustainable and can really create more of an asset and a strength for, for San Jose. And just just for those, I'm sure all of you are familiar with what's um, coming around the corner, so to speak, for for Deer Down Station. But uh, that's the big. Uh, that's going to be really one of the, the most important uh, transit centers in the West Coast. If you think about uh, the different types of transit that will be there, we, in fact, the, the tra type of transit we already have there. But by bringing BART there, um, ultimately, you know, high-speed rail. The plan is to have it, uh, the actual high-speed rail train, end in. San Jose, but continue to San Francisco in a, in a blended system. But if you can just imagine a, train, a, a, a station that's going to have bus, light rail, um, a variety. I'm on the Caltrain board as well, so Deer Downs, we're very excited about the development of Deer Down for Caltrain's purposes. Uh, Ace Train, and then you have BART, then you have Heist Rail. I mean, so we have to, as a city, then plan the community around that type of energy and that number of people, and that's it's, it's an enormous opportunity for us. And so all those parking lots you see out in front of Deerdon, that's just, it's really gonna extend our downtown westward all the way to the train station and beyond as you go down the Alameda. So it's, a, it's, it's gonna be an extraordinary place. It already is providing some opportunities, but we're very excited about it, and we certainly invite all of you to be part of that planning process. Rod and I are a couple of the people that are on a Deer Dawn Station Area Planning Committee, and so we meet uh, fairly regularly to make sure we're all on the same track, so to speak. <laughs> yes, you're in the back. Hey. I'm Eugene Bradley, I'm the least local on Broadway Training. This is a couple again, that I've been seeing a lot of who have to see me around a bit. One thing, one question I have in regard to the development that I didn't see in the presentation, procurement proper police and firefighters. I was reading that San Jose alone is just about quarter of the officers short of where it's needs to course its current population. So I was wondering how would these new transit villages be able to be safe enough to have at least public safety people come in case somebody gets robbed or even hurt? Well, I, I mean, I've been in the thick of the discussions regarding public safety in San Jose, and I agree it's unacceptable where we are as a city. Um, and so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to turn that around very quickly. But in general, when you're talking about these villages, it provides the opportunity to really, uh, just like I mentioned about other services, it concentrates services. So it's actually easier uh, in terms of public safety to keep villages safer than sprawled out neighborhoods over many, many, many you know, acres and square miles and kind of spread out. San Jose right now is a very difficult place to police and for fire protection because we're almost 180 square miles. Uh, we're almost 180 square miles and we have a million people. And uh, the more densely you're populated, you get a higher concentration of tax revenue for services and you also get it, make it easier to respond because now you can get your stations closer together. You can have patrols, officers more highly concentrated. So as a general principle, transit villages op offer an opportunity to actually provide a safer community than if you're very spread out and you have resources that are really spread thin. Thank you. Yeah. Greg? Uh, I'm Greg Bauman from the Silicon Valley Business Journal. So I think this is for the whole panel. Could you itemize the steps that it takes to uh, incentivize a developer to actually take on uh, the kind of transit village that Mr. Layden describes, so they're going to make enough dough that they want to do it? Uh, the uh, transit village that I described is a is a goal, is a, an ideal plan. I think it could not be directly and immediately fi financed by the market. It's going to take external subsidy. Um, and these are available from, from the federal level, from the state level, from the, the regional level, from the local level. They're all in a period of low supply at the moment. But I think it will take, uh, it, it will take an, a, a external supply, external finance subsidy to build them in, in the state that I would like to see them built. I'd like to take the, the chance, though, to go back to the couple of questions about uh, income distribution in this country and income distribution in this situation. Um, this is, a, of course, a huge national problem. Um, and with luck, we're we'll, on the way to a solution to it. But as between sprawl, or the traditional way of living, uh, with cars, um, and transit-oriented development, particularly for low-income people, 
transit oriented development is cheaper. It's just a lot cheaper. If you live in sprawl or in the, in the, in the car dominated environment situation, as most of us do, and owning a car, using a, having a car is simply necessary. You have to have it to lead a normal economic life and to go back and forth to work. AAA says that owning a car now costs basically $10,000 a year. And so if you can move your situation from automobile reliance to transit reliance, you, you have the potential to save five, six, seven thousand dollars a year. And I think that's a major contribution to the income picture. Uh, let me mention that this is exactly what uh, uh, Jessica said just now. When you think of income and you think of income and outgo for a low income family, you don't want to think of housing by itself. You want to think of the proposition of housing and the transportation that it requires together. Um, to, to Greg's question about what it takes to, to get there in terms of the, the right incentives to have this development, um, I would look to some of the cities that have um, had some of the, the development happen and the big thing that, that I see that's different from this region is that over time, I mean land is so scarce there and we don't yet have that scarcity. Um, you know, we are not building outwards much anymore, but, but having, it, it's a question of both physical scarcity and political will again, to not allow the development to go elsewhere and not allow it to be in a different form, not allow it to be sprawl, precisely, um, but to instead say, you know, we are concentrating our choices and, and over time it changes the fundamentals. And one of the most difficult things about that is that we do not have one jurisdiction in the Bay Area that can make that choice. You know, if, if San Jose says that, somebody can go, you know, over the border to Santa Clara and they might have a different answer, although Kevin can, can speak to that better than I. Um, but, but I think that is, that is the, the challenge that we have to reinforce this, this idea of scarcity to create the development values that um, make this kind of development pencil. Let me just add that there are incentives that a city could give in terms of um, reducing parkland dedication fees or um, construction taxes, et cetera. But what we find one of the biggest impediments is really the financial market, that they're not comfortable yet with high density, mixed use development in cities like San Jose. I don't know how many financial um, companies I've entertained, welcomed them to San Jose, given them a tour, and they, are, they open their eyes and they say, oh, we had no idea. We just thought you were just one giant suburb, you know, parking lot after parking lot. And when they saw the actual urbanity of downtown, still not quite as urban as, as we'd like in the long term, but it's getting there, it really started to change the discussion. So part of it is making sure that Wall Street knows what we're trying to achieve, so that way they can change their lending parameters, and instead of asking for a zillion parking places for every housing unit, start acknowledging that we're going to go to zero parking. We're going to unbundle parking. We're going to take care of things differently. So, so that's one of our biggest constraints, because it's all about money. People who can self finance, they're, those are the ones we're really working with, but those that have to rely on Wall Street, they have some big hurdles ahead. And then I'll, I'll just circle back to the, the political will aspects. I think they laid out some of the challenges. And uh, I think, as Jessica mentioned, the scarcity, uh, the, the, the political will, the, the, the zoning, general planning can create that scarcity if you truly uh, stick to it, though, and, and don't bend when it comes to the time, the decision making. Because there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of pressure that's being put in. And you certainly want jobs. You want, um, you want development. And I'm I'm not anti-development, I'm pro-good development. And so that's, you know, I, I really, I don't think anyone that's seen the way I operate thinks I'm anti-development at all, because I'm not. I just want to make sure we have the developments that make sense into the future. When I campaigned back in 08, at that time, right before the housing crash and Coyote Valley development was a reality, and they even had plans drawn out for it, I was only public, uh, I was only candidate that was publicly campaigning against developing Coyote Valley. It wasn't because I didn't realize we need, had the need for homes, I just thought they should be somewhere else. And so, uh, but again, that political will only comes, is only as strong as the community that supports it. And so I think that with the creating that scarcity, people like Laurel 
sharing with financers, you know, what the changes are coming around the corner, we can make it happen. Um, before we take the next question, let me kind of chime in on this one. Uh, Senator Bell, last year, passed a bill through both houses that would have recreated the redevelopment concept around train stations. It would have allowed benefit assessment districts to be created around train stations throughout the state of California and allowed then the concept of redevelopment value capture to accrue to the advantage of the city and the transit agency that had that train station. The governor asked him not to bring it forward for signature last year, but I think Jim's going to bring it forward this year. If it passes, it gives the opportunity for the incentive funds that Peter identified. Second point, if you go high enough, you don't need incentives. It's just when you get stuck in that five to ten story area that you got to get incentives because it's more difficult to build in that area. But when you get above 12, 10, 12 stories, any good developer is going to make money in this valley. I, I see Ron Swinson back there, Barry's brother, and uh, they know how to do it. Just give them a chance. And uh, by the way, Ron and Barry are also working on developing a new transportation concept called pod cars uh, for the United States. So, Ron, thanks for being here. Yes, sir, you had a question right here. Yes, my name is Barry Chen. I'm the uh, Latino City Council member. This question for Ash. Uh, you were talking about the rapid, uh, of the rapid transit system or two rail systems, uh, public transit system. But then why VTA is proposing to expand two more lanes on Highway 85, encourage a single occupancy car, which doesn't make any sense and it's not solving the problem and create a lot of animosity along the 85. In the meantime, I have talked to Carl Gardino. We were planning to put a, some kind of sales tax uh, measure up on 2016. So we really upset that many people there, and then you try to get the measure passed, you will have a hard time. And then it doesn't make a sen any sense at all, because I talked to BTA uh, congestion manager, and then he said this is a temporary fix. So my question is, why we want to suffer, you know, spending $170 million for a temporary fix, which is not going to solve a long-term problem, which will make a long-term problem much, much, not much harder. That doesn't make any sense to me. So can you explain no. to me? Well, look, I, there's certainly no shortage of the opportunities for VTA to make everyone upset. Uh, and so <laughs> we're just trying to find a way. You know, we're upsetting people all over the whole region in different ways. But <laughs> uh, the reality is, look, the, 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 there are a number, as you know, and I, and I know you studied the issue, uh, there are a number of different ways to deal with the congestion issue and that has to do with both encouraging and, and adding capacity to public transit as well as dealing with the congestion management on the roads that we have. This issue, of course, is an open issue. Uh, I do think that there's value to having some of, the, the, some of these kinds of lanes depending on what the situation is. And so, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to go back to BTA and have it further analyzed and further discussed. So it's a public debate right now and it should be. Um, so before we make any decision on, on how we should go forward. But the reality is that this kind, you know, this kind of, I would, I would agree with, with, with one aspect of, of your concern in that, you know, there, there are a number of different tools in the toolbox, and every tool doesn't always work in, in every place. And so I think that's really where VTA, the, 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 the leadership as well as the, the board should be focusing on, is this the right tool in the right place? We're giving the indication at least from VTA that it is. Now, it doesn't, I mean that it doesn't require further analysis, and so I'm happy to sit down with you and, and do more analysis on it. Councilmember Chang, thank you for being here. Sure. Question here, and then over there. If you don't keep the cameraman happy, you yeah. can read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name is Shara Glenn. I'm with the San Jose Peace and Justice Center. And uh, my question has, I mean, I, I love the idea of the transit villages. And the only thing is that there's one element that, that's missing. We've talked about you know, uh, high density residential, high density, you know, uh, concentrated commercial, maybe some industrial. But the one mi missing element here is, is higher education campuses. I came to, to, to San Jose in, in the late 1950s. At that time, San Jose had a population of 100,000. And it had one 
four, eight, four year university campus and that was San Jose State, uh, State College. Today, we have a million people in San Jose. We still have only one four year uh, institution of higher education. And, and so, and, and when, when, the, when the development plan was there for, you know, initially for, for Coyote Valley, it was residential, some industrial and commercial. There was no plan for education, for higher education. So my question is, uh, and the other aspect of it is that, that no, you ask the question. Okay, so, so, so the question is, is that given that, that, that university campuses are very friendly to, to public transit, uh, bicycles and, and buses and so forth, what is what is being done to, to incorporate uh, a, a new campus in, in the planning of, of the transit villages? Yeah. So uh, it's a great question around how we can plan for our campus. I'm not sure if it's on. Um, so just a, a point of fact, uh, Gavilon College was uh, planning a campus in uh, North Coyote Valley. So higher education institutions were very much part of the Coyote Valley plan. I'm not sure where Gavilon is and they're um, planning at this particular time, but they had purchased land and they were moving forward at, at some point, but we'll see. So in terms of transit villages, let me just start start with uh, San Jose State University. We've got some of our students here uh, today and I th would say that campus is growing and it what's great about San Jose State is that they are now recognizing that they're in downtown and part of the downtown community. So rather than just being a commuter campus, they're building on-campus housing and really looking at how they can contribute to the community of San Jose rather than just being um, kind of an adjunct. We've got other private uh, universities that are coming into to our uh, community, so we are working with them. You know, the UC system and the state of California system, that's a whole different uh, way of planning for, uh, for education. But we welcome schools of all uh, types, whether it's elementary and secondary or post-secondary. We, we really have to stop now. So one minute from each of you. One minute. <laughs> Thank you. I would just really thank all of you for coming and really think about how you can apply what you've been hearing this afternoon to whatever work you're doing. If you're in the nonprofit, government, or private sectors, we encourage your partnership. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to uh, thank Rod and MTI as well as Transform. Uh, the, the, these summits are extraordinarily helpful as a policymaker, and it really makes me feel like uh, sometimes when you're in times of despair and you don't think you're going to be able to get where we need to go when it comes to these urban villages. I know we can, but it's only if um, we stay together on this issue and, and we help educate the broader community. So let's all be true leaders and let's also all be activists together in order to make sure that uh, we create the community that uh, we want to live in. I'd like to thank uh, Rod and uh, Transform, the organizers. It's been a great occasion, um, and I hope we've moved the dialogue forward. Um, I, I just make one quick observation. Um, transportation problems, almost by definition, or certainly in practice, move outside city boundaries, and there's something that's really handled at the regional level. The region in the Bay Area is very weak in relation to the cities. Cities have fought off a strong region for many, many, many years. So one of the steps in the path to resolving these problems is strengthening the region. Now, there was one observation within that. It, in the region, there are four main bodies, the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, um, ABAG, and then two others. Of these, far and away, the most wealthy is the MTC, the, tra the holder of transportation money. They are gradually becoming more integrated, but they would make the great improvement of the situation if transportation money could be used for land uses across the Great Canyon, the Great Barrier, uh, used for land uses that directly relate to, trans relate to transportation, and TOD fills that bill. It could greatly benefit from transportation funding. Thank you very much. Um, parting thought would just be uh, for all of us, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but for all of us to ourselves and encourage our neighbors to really walk the walk when it comes to supporting more density and um, doing our own part to take transit, to walk, to bike, etc. So if nothing else, you'll learn how hard it is or how not hard it is. Thanks to our panel. Remember Peter's book? It's really outstanding. Uh, Kevin, thank you for being here from Santa Clara. That's my hometown. 
and uh, uh, know that you're going to be doing a good job there. And thanks to all of you for being here. Now, each one of them has to, each one of us has to become a warrior in this battle and make sure we give them the support that they need in order to do the right thing for the long-term future. Thank you all for being here.